This is the Rosetta Stone, okay? This is arguably the most famous ancient Egyptian relic that we have. And the reason why it's important, um, I think it was actually carved in Memphis, I believe, which was the capital of, of Lower Egypt. I mean, I can't remember what date it is. You'll have to read that. It's quite late on. But it has three different languages. Some say two, but it's actually it's three. You have the hieroglyphics. You have what's known as demotic, a script form of, of, of hieroglyphics. So ultimately it is the same language. And you have Greek. And this um, allowed the, the French um, Egyptologist and linguist um, Champillion uh, to finally make the breakthroughs relating to um, the, the translation of the hieroglyphs. This was in, I can't remember, 1820s, 1830s, that sort of period. Um, and after that, they got the hang of it and the rest came naturally. So that's that. But the importance, I would say, and this needs to be remembered, is that a knowledge of the hieroglyphic language was preserved not just through Coptic times, you know, they're the Christian uh, Egyptians in the early centuries of the, the first millennium, but also by the Arab people, the alchemists, the alchemists in the Arab world, right up until about eight or 900 B, uh, AD, had a knowledge of the hieroglyphs, and there's been books written about this, which I've got, knew the hieroglyphs, knew what they meant and used them in alchemical, magical works for exactly the reason why they should be used. So that knowledge was in the Arab world through until medieval times. What happened to it after that, nobody knows. Whether it became part of a secret tradition, whether it became more occult and, you know, it became some of the earliest occult symbols or not, we don't know. But it's important to remember that that knowledge of the hieroglyphs was carried forward at least until probably the 8th or 9th century AD. So, but then it took us back to the 19th century to understand it again. Right, just out of interest, behind us here, you have um, a statue of what I would guess is a queen, but she has the headdress on of Hathor, the goddess Hathor, the, the cow goddess. Because all queens were seen as like an embodiment on earth of the goddess Hathor. And the reason why Hathor was so important is that she was seen as almost like a primeval mother of life in Egypt. Not the only one, but one of. And that the queens were seen to be that embodiment, whereas the kings were seen to be an embodiment, or generally, of the god Horus. Okay, in life they were embodiments of the god Horus. Um, that's the, the general, um, you know, rule at least. So whilst the pharaohs represented Horus, their wives or queens represented Hathor. And we'll see a few more images of Hathor as we go up here. Um, she is possibly one of the oldest of the ancient Egyptian goddesses. That's why she crops up so much. Right, we're going to go that way. Right. Um, right, there's a few artifacts here that I, I want to draw people's attention to. One, a very beautiful offering bowl here made of stone look at the, the incredible workmanship of this it's almost like it's molded um, on each end are heads of the goddess Hathor uh, and remember she's a cow goddess um, and she has the cow's ears if she's shown with a human head but she's also shown as a cow as I say, there's a relationship between Hathor and Sekhmet, but there's also a relationship between Hathor and another goddess who we'll meet up in the first floor called Nuit, spelled N-U-T, Nuit. Um, and she's a goddess of the sky and the Milky Way, but we'll, we'll talk about her later. But Hathor was part of almost the same cult, basically. Hathor was also very much associated with the Milky Way. Um, so, uh, but that's something we'll come on to. But as we walk up here, there is a beautiful statue of another goddess in her form of the cat. And her name is Bastet. Bast or Bastet. 
And I mean, this is another goddess who was known as an Eye of Ra. Um, and although this is a nice little puddy cat here, the earliest forms of Bastet from about the, the, fir the first and second dynasties of Egyptian history, going back to sort of two, 2800, 2900 BC, she was a, another lioness. She had a, like a fierce lioness and eventually, for some reason, she became a sort of domestic cat. Uh, not quite sure why, but uh, I mean, obviously, Bastet is a, a favourite goddess of sort of New Ages into ancient Egypt, um, I suppose because they've got pussycats, I suppose. But um, anyway, it's, it's a fabulous statue. Um, and whilst I just see it here, there's a beautiful statue of the um, hippopotamus god here, goddess, I should say, goddess, obviously, um, which is Tawarat. I'm assuming it's Tawarat. Yep. Um, made of what's known as breccia. This, this, this stone with all the other bits of stone in it is known as breccia. Okay? And you can see this. And I mean, this was another mother of life in ancient Egypt. I mean, you can see almost that, you know, she appears to be pregnant. And often children were given little amulets of Tawarat. Tawarat, uh, you know, like babies had um, amulets of Tawara around their neck because this was a goddess not only of, of, of motherhood but also of children in their infancy and so this particular goddess was evoked to protect these and that's important to point out that, that all of these gods and goddesses they're not just statues the reason that they had them was to evoke the force the spirit of those particular deities to bring them to life you know, I mean, if you had that in your home, or, well, presumably not your home, your local temple or something, you would it would be believed that you could quite literally communicate with that goddess via that statue. That statue becomes the portal, the point of contact between this world and the world in which this goddess existed. And they would have seen a world in which she revolved around, you know, probably the Nile, Bull rushes, whatever else it was, that you know, their equivalent of the psychic or medium, that's say it's a shaman or shamaness, you know, would have been able to to see the world in which these particular gods or goddesses existed. So that's that. Right, now we're going to move on to something called the Shabaka stone. Okay, right, this is known as the Shabaka stone. I first actually learnt about this um, reading. The Orion Mystery by my friend and colleague uh, Robert Bouval, and it was actually created around 700 BC during the reign of a king called Shabaka or Shabako, and it's been massively defaced because it's been used as a, a millstone, a milling stone. But the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic inscription on it talks about something very, very significant in the, the mythological history of ancient Egypt. And that's about the battle between Horus and Set, this huge battle which revolved around the north and south of the country, and eventually how the gods settled it, that, that basically said, look, you've got to settle this, you know, Horus, you can have the, the, the north of the country and Set, you can have the south of the country. I think it's that way around. I could have it the other way around, but we won't worry about that for the moment. Because the two gods met where the division of these, of these, of Upper and Lower Egypt at a place called Ayan, A-Y-A-N. And at first um, Set said, yeah, all right, okay, I'll have half, you can have half, and whatever. But then... Horus, for some reason, said, no, nah, actually, I want it all. And he took over the whole of, of it. And, but, okay, this is that story, that's a nice myth. But the significance of it is that Ayan was a real place. And it existed just to the south of the Giza Plateau. Um, and this was the division. Robert Bouvard talks about it in his books, I talk about it in my books, because the area of Ayan was the place, supposedly, where Osiris was killed 
and his body thrown into the water. And this was a very important mythological place in Egypt. I've traced what I believe was the location of it. And I think there was a primeval mound there that goes back even before the time of dynastic Egypt. And what's interesting is that if you stand at that spot, you can see the three belt stars of the Cygnus constellation setting one each other, what, what, yeah, one into each of the three Giza pyramids, okay? And not only is that seen on a horizontal level, but if you look down on the Giza plateau, the position of those three pyramids matches exactly, I mean absolutely exactly, the position of those same three stars in the Cygnus, uh, the, the wing of Cygnus, the celestial bird, as it is above in the sky. And this, the reason why this is important will come on to when we go into the first floor with all of the sarcophagus and the coffins uh, from ancient Egypt. But we'll come on to why Cygnus and the Milky Way was so important when we're up there. So that's the Shabaka stone. But even when it was recorded down in about 700 BC, the text tells us that already it was a really, really ancient, you know, script that was now falling apart and they had to record it down. So that's what that says. I mean, it's obviously a shame that it's been so defaced, but at least we've got, you know, the gist of what, what, of what it says. Okay, right, that's it. So we're going up there now. Yeah, it's another Sekhmet statue there. 